All right, it is episode eight of the Philly Sports Convo, and my guest really needs no introduction because uh, he, he's a Phillies legend. He's one of my favorite guests from the old TV show that I had. Larry Boa, thank you for doing this. I always appreciate your time, and it's good to have you here. Well, thanks, Jason. In the in the days and weeks before spring training, uh, what kind of excitement do you have? I, I start really getting excited uh, after the first of the year because, you know, it, it comes around real fast. Uh, even though I'm, I am not a member of the coaching staff or the manager. I love baseball. You know, I, I uh, the Phillies let me go down and get in uniform during spring training. Right. Get fungos with Bobby, Wilson, who's the infield instructor. So it's a lot of fun, you know, and, and obviously the expectations. So it's a lot easier when you come here and you're expected to win as opposed to, well, if they play 500, that'd be great. The, the expectations, you know, we all remember how last season ended. Um, certainly not the way we, we hoped and wanted it to end. So you got to think these guys are coming into spring training with a chip on their shoulder. Uh, and, and I think back to your teams in the 70s, in 76, 77, 78, when you didn't get past the LCS. I imagine you had, you had a similar feeling coming into spring training. So what are those guys feeling like right now? I'm sure they're very motivated. I mean, uh, I'll give us the fact that Houston beat us in the World Series, but last year it was very disappointing. Yeah. In fact, I, I didn't think it was the way it ended. It didn't feel like a real good season because even though we lost two games out in Arizona, we won the, the third one. All we had to do was come home and win one game out of the next two. And, uh, you know, I, I really believe that uh, that uh, uh, that – sour taste in your mouth it lingers did you take your cap off to a team that maybe played better than you but i really believe we had a better team than arizona not taking anything away from arizona but i look at our lineup and i looked at their lineup and i guess that's why you play the games jason as you well know that's not... uh, we didn't do it the two games we came home we we, we quit i shouldn't say we quit hitting. we just didn't hit as a right, team. right. The, the the offense just wasn't there in the last two games. And right. You're right. It, it was it was very disappointing. Um, you know, everybody thought on paper the Phillies had the better team. Um, I mean, there was even talk. I remember after winning the first two games at home, hey, they might not be coming back to Philadelphia at all, <laughs> right? Let alone I losing the that. series. I, I was thinking that, you know, because I I watched both teams, and again, I'm not taking anything away from Arizona. Sure. They're very athletic, and they played very well against us. You got to take your cap off to them. You know, they're down two to nothing, and they come roaring back. And I, I think game four was a biggie when they pinch hit home run. But, uh, uh, again, I just think our guys, because we have some veterans, a lot of veterans, use this as a motivational tool. I, I'm looking at it third time's a charm. We went two years ago to the World Series. There, so hopefully this year we can get back to where we want to go. I, I like that. I like that. Now, if, if you could look into your crystal ball, uh, how do you see 2024 shaping up? I mean, they, they the, the the Phillies still have a hell of a team. I mean, obviously you Real still good. you still have Atlanta, and and they're tough. Yeah. But what what do you think happens this season? Well, we do have a very good team. Uh, our pitching's good. Our bullpen's good. You you've seen our starting lineup, top to bottom. We can score runs. I know we did in the last <clears> couple <throat> games in the playoffs, but uh, we have a lineup. You know, you got to look at at two guys in particular. You got to look at Trey Turner and Harper. Sure. Trey Turner, the first two and a half months, he'll be the first to tell you he didn't play up to the expectations everybody thought, but he really turned it on. I think he got a comfort zone there <clears> and he started playing. And Harp was on the shelf early. So you're talking about two big time bats that missed a lot of the season. I shouldn't say uh, Trey Turner didn't miss it, but, but yeah, I know, mentally, I know what you mean. Yeah. Trying, I really think he was trying too hard. Sometimes you get a big contract like that. You try to justify it every game. There's pressure. And then finally, he, he went to the park, and, of course, the standing ovation he got one night. I don't know if it was coincidental, but from there on, he played like everyone expected him to, and we got to see the real Trey Turner. Uh, I think you're going to see 
the three guys that I thought played well all year were uh, Baum, Marsh, and and Scott. I mean, those guys. If you look at our lineup, no you say, "Well, if they contribute, we're going to be great." They played consistent, even though those last two games, they were the guys that came up with some hits at that time. So I look for them to get better. Uh, Rojas in center field, if he can hit two fifty, I mean, that's a big, big plus. I I agree with you. His defense is amazing. A, a very year, but, right, and and I just think that uh, I think uh, the Ducks are all the Ducks are in a row here for us to. We got to get out of the gate, Jason. We, you know, the last couple of years we have not gotten out of the gate. April and May have been very slow starts for us. Yeah, I think it's imperative uh, when we leave spring training. And you know what? We're going to have a team right out of the gate that we're going to be facing, and it's going to be the Atlanta Braves at our part. And Atlanta's got a very good team. They made some nice adjustments and and pickups. Uh, obviously, they're them and us are going to be the two teams that everybody in the East is going to try to knock off. And you want to talk about a chip on their shoulder. I imagine the Braves are going to have revenge on their minds, right? Oh, they have two years in a row now. <laughs> yeah, won right. The and we've knocked them off the pedestal. So I'm sure that that lingers with those guys, too. I mean, they, they're tired of winning it. And then we get to the, the playoffs. So it's going to be a good race. I think it's going to be a very good race. You, you talked about the standing ovation for Trey Turner. You've been around this fan base for a long time. Knowing what you know about these fans, did that surprise you? Shocked. I was <laughs> shocked. Because back when we played, I mean, we all know they're very avid fans. But I know it's a different generation now, and it's not at the vet. So I think they all got together. And, of course, the radio station started it by saying, hey, let's try something else. Instead of booing him when he got when he kept making outs yeah. or striking out, let's let's get any ovation and like i said it was just a matter of time if you really want to look at his body of work since he's been in the big leagues it's off the charts this guy's a great player oh sure and it was just a matter of time it just he started off slow i really believe that that's behind him now i don't think he has to prove to anybody that the contract he signed he's definitely worth it yeah the pressure's on so i i I think he's gonna be fine in fact i would expect trey turner to start the way he finished last year. He finished strong, and I expect that for the whole year. This guy's a consistent player, can do so many things on the baseball field, beat you with his legs, beat you with his bat, beat you with his glove, and uh, I think he's going to be a lot more relaxed coming into spring training this year. You know, talking about the fans, uh, I, I love asking you about the fans because I love hearing you talk about the fans and, and, and how the fans, what the fans meant to you in your career. Can you talk about that? They, they motivated me. I right. mean, I, if you didn't come to the park ready to play, they'd let you know. And I don't see anything wrong with that, Jason. I, I think that, you know, they pay good money to watch professional baseball. I think the easiest thing to do when you're on a baseball field is play hard and hustle for nine innings. If you do that, I'm not saying you're not going to get booed, but over the course of 162 games, or I should say 81 games when you play at home, sure. if you give them effort every time you take the field, you're eventually going to win them over. And I think that was a big thing with Trey. He, you never seen him dog it, even though he was struggling. He'd always hustle on ground balls. He'd uh, steal bases even when he wasn't getting hits. He'd get a walk, steal second, steal third. Uh, I don't think anybody questioned this guy's effort. But I think when we played, if you weren't ready to play, they knew that you weren't prepared, and they would let you have it. There's no question in my mind. But it has changed a lot, the mentality of the fan now. The generation's different. So I sort of like the fact that uh, they got up as one and gave him a standing ovation, and uh, he responded. Did you ever get booed? And it may sound like a, yep. dumb, it may sound like a dumb question, but, but I, you know, there, there are certain people, there are some athletes in this town who it seems like for the most part, it was, it was mostly positive. You're one of them. Bernie Perrant's one of them with the, with the Flyers, but you're saying you did get booed from time to time. I did. Yeah, I got booed early in my career. Okay. I mean, I, I, I would have booed me too. I mean, I wasn't <laughs> a very good hit. Believe me, I had to work at that. I, nothing came natural. And, you know, through the hard work and everything, I got over 2,000 hits. And I think they started recognizing that, you know, hey, I worked hard at becoming a, a more, uh, a better hitter than I was when I first came up. But, hey, let's face it, when, when you're making outs and you're not contributing offensively, they have that right to boo. But it wasn't for a long period of time. For the most part, fans were always on my side. And, uh, you know, I, I think if you play hard, like I said, 
and hustle for nine innings, 27 outs, you're going to win them over eventually. You, you mentioned your stats, and that just brought a question to my mind. Um, and, and forgive me because I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to make you talk about yourself <laughs> and talk yourself <laughs> up if you don't mind. But, you know, I, I always wondered why you weren't in the hall of fame. Do you think you deserve to be in the hall of fame? You know what, Jace? I, I, I think the hall of fame right now is, uh, I, it's, it's very difficult to try to gauge what they're doing. I know there's a couple Short stuffs in there, uh, Phil Rizzuto and Pee Wee Reese, and I looked at their numbers. Ex- Obviously, they played New York. Right. Uh, my numbers are a lot better. Absolutely. Than theirs, that's what I, right. That's what it, I mean. It's yeah. It's, yeah, but it's different now. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I believe right now that I'm not saying all the Hall of Fame writers do this. There are a lot that are all over uh, analytics. And my reply to those guys that just look at the analytic part, you don't even have to go to a baseball game. Just let somebody print out the analytic stuff and the ones that have big pluses, then put them on your ballot. There's so many ways to win baseball games. It's not just hitting three run homers. It's not striking out a guy with the bases loaded. I agree. Uh, you know, you can bunt, you can hit and run, you can steal, you can sacrifice. You can score from first on a double with a good secondary lead. You can steal bases in tough times. Uh, th- th- those seem to be by the wayside now. It's like, well, let's see what his on-base percentage is. Oh, I mean, a guy like Joey Gallo, I have nothing against Gallo, but the analytics love him. I mean, he gets, what, 40 home runs a year. He hits 200, maybe under that. Strikes out close to 200 times, but he walks over 100 times. And the analytic people feel that that's, that's a positive sign for people. You know, it's hard for me to, to, to judge that, uh, that that's being successful. But it, like I said, it's a different generation. I think it's impossible. I really believe this to compare players today than back when I played or even before I played or yeah. even a little bit after I played because the game is so much different. I, I get a little angry when I hear people talk about Acuna's stolen bases last year. He's a great player, but let Ricky Henderson, let uh, Coleman, <laughs> let all those guys that stole hundred bases the right way, put those rules in the way they are. Now you throw over there twice. You don't get them third time. It's a ball. These guys might have 200 stolen bases. I, I agree so with don't, you. Don't, don't make a big deal out of, uh, hey, like I said, he's a great player. I'm not taking No, I, I, I get you. Don't, don't keep bringing up, oh, he shattered this record. He didn't. He shattered maybe the, the, the way the rules are right now, that record. Yeah. Ricky Henderson with those rules, I, I can't even imagine. Oh, and and you're right. You know, what, could, they, they talk about, you talk about breaking records. Stolen. You know, my, uh, Vince Coleman too. Absolutely. You know, I, I you know what I love, yeah. Larry. I love when when people talk about how you know so and so now has the postseason record for home runs or whatever postseason record for right. whatever. <laughs> There's more rounds now. Right. I mean, back in There's the day, you did. It used to be the best out of five. The second, you know, it wasn't the best. That it wasn't best out of seven. First, it started out best out of three, then best out of five, then eventually best out of seven. But like you said, there's so many more teams now. Yeah. So there's more games played. So. Obviously, they are records. There's no question, but there should be a, a a little footnote at the bottom saying, "Well, this guy played uh, 20 more uh, games than exactly. Joe Doe got back in the day." So. Yeah. Well, you know, and 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 talking about the Hall of Fame, I want to ask you about about Jimmy Rollins and Chase Utley, and in particular Jimmy Rollins, because when the Hall of Fame vote came out, you you put a post on Twitter, or, or X, or whatever they're calling it these days, but you put a post on Twitter saying, you know, essentially that you were shocked his vote total was so low that he's a Hall of Famer. Uh, and I, I agree with you, but what's your reasoning for that? Well, all you got to do is look at his body of work. Yep. I mean, he's, he's up there with uh, with Derek Jeter as far as numbers. I know Jeet won a lot more World Series. Uh, Jimmy was a Hall of uh, uh, most valuable player. He got big hits. He played shortstop incredibly defensive wise. Uh, he could steal your bases. I guess he didn't hit 300, but the things he did negated the fact that he didn't hit 300. You know, he didn't have to hit 300. He, he was a, a, a beast when he got on the bases. Uh, and defensively, I don't think at that time there was anybody as good as him. I really don't. All I'm saying is, I think Jimmy's going to get in, but I think it's embarrassing that he only got 14%. It is crazy. I think this is the second or maybe the third time. And, and nothing against Chase. Chase is probably going to get in too. 
But if you look at Chase's games played, he missed a lot towards the end because of injuries. Right. But Chase also has credentials. His credentials speak for themselves. See, but he got close to what did he get? Thirty or forty percent this time. He was cl- it, he had a lot of yeah. It was a big percentage of time on. And and that's the thing I was complaining about that Jimmy the fourteen percent it's really embarrassing if you watched him play. You got to say, I, and I'm not saying he should have been voted in this time. These numbers should rise a lot yeah, the next you, two or three times. You would hope so. That they vote. You would hope so. And you know. I'll tell you, he had one of the iconic uh, one of the iconic hits in Philly's history. And if you'll forgive me, because if I remember correctly, it was a, I was coach. Yeah, you were on the other side of that of that hit, right? The the, the walk off yep. against Broxton was was it oh nine or oh eight? I I get that mixed up. It was oh eight. It was oh eight. Okay. 08. Yeah, that was. Yep. I mean that 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 hit that walk off hit will live on forever. I told him he owes me a lot of money. He took some <laughs> money out of my pocket. He laughs to this day. Yeah, it was a huge hit. It was. I mean, uh, it 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 would have. If we win that game, puts us in the driver's seat. They won it and put them in the driver's seat, and they went on and eventually won the World Series. Yeah, because I, I and correct me if I'm wrong, because you probably remember this better than I do. But if if the Dodgers win that game, it's two two going back to L. A. Right, and it said it was was right, it three one. Right. That's what it was. It it ended up three one. Got it. Okay. No, it would have been two to two if we'd have won that. If, game. if the Dodgers but won, they beat right? Us. Right. Right. Got it. Right. Well, you know, if I may say, I think Jimmy Rollins is tied for the best shortstop in Philly's history. I think to, to, to me, <laughs> you know what, you know what, Jace, that's a compliment for me because I, <laughs> I, I, I schooled Jimmy. Uh, I would be the first to tell you when he first came up, I probably would have said, "Oh, this guy's not going to hit home runs. He's a singles and doubles hitter. He could generate as much power. You probably don't know him, but there was a guy they called the Toy Cannon in Houston, uh, Win." Jimmy Wynn, he was built like uh, like Jimmy uh, mm. Rollins. This guy hit balls in a wow. long way. And for the, the size that Jimmy Rollins was, Jimmy hits the balls in a long way for being not real big in statue, but he had great hand-eye coordination. He could hit, and he could do a lot of things on the baseball field. And one other um, Hall of Fame vote of note was Billy Wagner, another former Philly. I mean, he falls just short. What did he have, like 73.8%? That's got to hurt. Do, do you think he should get yeah, he needed four votes. Yes. Yes, I do. Uh, I, you know, people probably think, oh, you're just being prejudiced because he played with the Phillies. But, do you, again, take a look at his numbers. They're, they're off the charts. Uh, uh, and you to come up four, four votes, I think it was, short. Yeah, that's – And hopefully next year – That's tough. He can get over the hump. But, you know, sometimes you wonder. I mean, I hear quotes sometimes when a guy's not 100% the first ballot I'm saying I've heard I've seen quotes where they say, well, I don't want to put him on there the first time ballot hundred percent. Why? If he's a hall of famer, what difference does it make I, if it's year one or year eight? I, I, you're not playing anymore. He can't get better and he can't get worse. That's right. That's so you. why would you, why would you proclaim something like that? I think uh, Jeter had 99%. I think he missed some one guy didn't vote for Jeter. I don't know why. I mean, he should be embarrassed. I think uh, the latest that was a hundred was uh, Mariano Rivera. Yep, he was unanimous. I think yep. he had a, he was a hundred percent. But there's going to be some guys coming up now that you say like Cabrera for that played with uh, Miami and Detroit. The numbers he put up that should be a no-brainer. That should be a hundred percent. You would think. Uh, but I'm I'm anxious to see what the vote total is going to be there, uh, and I'm sure whoever doesn't vote for him, they're going to have a reason. But uh, just to to me. It's not just about the analytic part of it. Is the guy a winner? And when he played, you know, you talk about when I played. When I played, there were two shortstops at that time. Ozzy came after us. Me and Dave Concepcion. Dave Concepcion, yeah. And during those 10 years, <laughs> we had good years. We really did. And, and Dave Concepcion, I'll be the first to tell you, I think he should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I agree. But again, that, that used to be the parameter. And then a 10-year period, you post up, you play every day. Will you – the top two or three at that position. And that's how it used to be, but now obviously that's sort of gone by the wayside. So another uh, ex-teammate of yours, and I, and I think this is a travesty, the late, great Dick Allen. Why is he not in the Hall of Fame, Larry? <laughs> Jace, you preaching to the choir. I have no idea. Check his numbers out. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're amazing. The char- you know what, 
I think I'm not saying that there's different writers now, but I think there's some old school writers that if a guy didn't give a good interview or maybe they caught him at a bad time and he says, get out of here. I don't feel like talking. That should not be held against anybody. What you do on the field. I, I'm not saying you're supposed to do that. If you're, if you had a bad game, you're, right. you should fess up. And, talk. and I'm not saying Dick didn't do that, but I, maybe he made some writers angry by not answering questions or get out of my face. Okay. Uh, well, well, then let me ask you but this. If you look at his numbers, Oh, I agree with you. His numbers are okay. great. Should the right. should the voting process be changed? Yes. I think it's too difficult to get in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. I think they're making it real difficult. You take a look at all the other uh, Hall of Fame. Th those numbers, when guys get in, it, it doesn't do anything sometimes. Football players, you can get three or four or five of them at a time. Hockey, the same way. Basketball. It's always like there's only two or three in baseball. And sometimes there's one. Uh, I, I just think the standards are really tough, and I don't know if they're going to change. I really don't. I think uh, another guy that came up short was Sheffield. Yeah, <laughs> look at his numbers. I mean, and he and he came out with a big article saying that it's very political now. So you know, I'm not going to get into that part of it. Sure, but Sheffield's another guy that uh, his numbers speak for himself. So you know, I think I think you know I. There was an era there where you look at the body of work. Obviously, steroids were involved with some of these guys. Mm -hmm. There should be a wing there saying, hey, you know what? These guys, their numbers speak for themselves, but they were associated with the steroid. It could be a different wing. But I don't know. I, I don't think that's ever going to happen because I will guarantee you this. There's some guys that they are in there now. They, I, I guarantee they, they were on, and I don't, I don't doubt I'm that not name and name or anything like that. But if you happen to beat the system, you're in the hall of fame. If you got, it seems like right now, even if somebody associates you with something like that, that's a black mark on your side. Well, so. you know, and you make a great point because if you think about it, the guy who is, you know, statistically the home run King. Barry Bonds, I mean, a lot of people still say Hank Aaron's the legit home run king. I'm not, I'm not going to go right. there, but Barry Bonds does have the higher total. He's not in. It's doubtful he's ever going to get in. A guy like Roger Clemens, one of the best pitchers of all time, he's not probably not going to get in. Right. You're right. If, if there was a separate wing, that, that's a pretty good solution. It, yeah, just put it out there and say, hey, there were suspicions that they were taking steroids, but these numbers, hey, Roger Clemens, that, that's a joke he's not in. Yeah. I mean, those, those numbers are off the charts. I agree with you. But, uh, you know, there's writers, and hey, I respect the writer if he says, no matter what, if you were guilty of taking steroids, I'm not voting for you. But you know what? Do that with everybody that you think or you know that takes steroids. Don't don't break it down into Clemens and, and Barry Bonds. Oh, I agree. Uh, I happen to see both of them play. Well, I'm not saying they took it. I'm not saying they didn't. They were dominant people in that sport. Bonds might have been the best left-handed hitter I've ever seen, and Clemens might have been the most out overpowering pitcher I've ever seen. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah. But uh, no, I, I, two good players. I, I agree. I agree. Very, very well said. All right. I, I have so much I want to get to, and I don't want to keep you too long. So I, I want to talk about that, that awesome team in 1980 that won it all, first world championship in Philly's history. What what made that team so special? I mean, besides the fact that you won, it it, it was it, there was more to it than that, right? But, yeah, there was, Jason. I, I think the big thing was that we had come up short with that team. I, I, to this day, I I look back at that team; it was an outstanding team. But people forget who we played: the Dodgers and the Big Red Machine. Yeah, two great teams. Um, and it wasn't like we got blown out. It was a pitch. It was a call. It was a air. Yeah. What was, was the a, bad call, Larry? In fact, it was. It was something. It was. It was your throw to first base, right? There, what you? What year? Yeah, what, what year am I thinking of? Dave, Davey Lopes. Davey Lopes. That's it. Hit a bullet off Mike. It came right to me. I barehanded it. Yes. Two to first, and Bruce. Fremming, we didn't have instant replay then, but Bruce Fremming, I guarantee, in his mind, said at that time, Davey Lopes was one of the fastest guys in the National League. Yeah. And he said, "Well, one." Got by Schmidt. There's no way 
that Bo is going to get that ball, throw to Richie Hebner, and throw him out. And to this day, and he was clearly out. If we, if we, he's out. He's out. And, and when I, before I took off the uniform, being a coach or a manager, I used to see Bruce from Fremming in in Milwaukee because I, I said, Bruce, you missed it. <laughs> no, I didn't, Bo. I said, yes, you did. You can admit it. It's oh, over. So with. he still it's hasn't done, admitted it. Oh yeah, no, he never did it. Oh my gosh, he will never. All you got to do is look at the replay. <laughs> oh, I know. It's unbelievable. <laughs> but that team, what we did, we could beat you nine to eight. We could beat you two to one. We we could steal bases. Obviously, we had some guys in the middle that could hit the ball out of the ballpark. We had good pitching. We had Tug McGraw at the back end. Yeah. We had Ron Reed setting up. There were really no flaws on that team. Um, like I said, we could beat you. If you want to slug it out, we'll beat you. If you want to go two to one, we can beat Our defense was impeccable. We had a... Gary Maddox in center field, me and Trio and Schmitty and Rose and Bob Boone behind the plate, uh, McBride in right, Bull in left. That was a, a, from a top to bottom lineup. It was a very good baseball team. And I think the other thing was we had four or five guys came up together in the minor league. We learned how to win together. We learned yeah. how to lose together. Makes sense. And we went through some tough times in the early 70s. We weren't ready to compete at a high level. We learned by getting our butt kicked early in the 70s. But we knew that the talent was there because we did it in the minor leagues together. I know minor leagues are a lot different than the big leagues, but we knew we could trust each other and we knew what each guy could do out there. Oh, sure. That's important. That's important. Uh, you, you mentioning Ron Reed reminded me of something. So I was at the game, was I guess it was a couple of years ago, when Ron Reed was put on the wall of, the, the, the wall of fame. Right. And I, right. In reading his bio, I had forgotten that he also played in the NBA. I mean, yes, this guy did. had to be some kind of an athlete. Big time athlete, you know. He, he, we were we would always talk to him about that, and he goes, "You guys have no idea how those big men hit you in the NBA." <laughs> <laughs> you know, when he said that, I just shook my head because I mean, Ron Reed's a big guy, but now you watch guys playing, and you're going, "Oh my God, he had to be getting banged around uh, underneath the boards there." But uh, for him to play in the NBA and and in Major League Baseball, he had to be a special athlete. Yeah, no doubt about that. So yeah, so so you talked about how the team can win nine to eight, can win two to one. How about the twenty three to twenty two? What year was that? The the game in Chicago. Yeah, that was. Gosh, I'm trying to think of the year that was. Um, was it like seventy eight? There, thereabouts. I think seventy eight or seventy nine. What makes that story really funny is Randy Lurch. I was going to ask you about that. I heard you tell Bob Costas this story, and I love it. Uh, we had pitched like three or four games, real good games, and we just didn't hit. We he got beat two to one, three to two, four to three, went deep into the game, and he probably didn't mean to say this, but he said it'd be nice if we would score some runs for him. Right. And so obviously, if you're not a pitcher and you read that, you take that personal. Of course. So lo and behold, we go to Wrigley Field. And we score seven runs in the top of the first. And I'm running by him as he's going out in the bottom. I said, is that enough runs for you? <laughs> and I just kept running. And they put up a six spot, the bottom of the first. And I don't think he made any more comments like that. But that was a back and forth game. That was a they crazy game. On and oh, it was unbelievable. The reason I, I think it was a great game, I got five hits that game. So <laughs> I thought it was a <laughs> tremendous game. But the win was howling out. Uh, the big boys, Kingman and Schmidt and Bull and those guys, all they had to do was get the ball in the air and it was going out. But it was a like a hurricane blowing out at Wrigley Field on a hot, muggy day. Now, after the Phillies, you actually spent some time in Chicago. What was it like right. playing at Wrigley Field? I mean, I, I will tell you, Wrigley's on my bucket list. I've never been there, but I, I've always wanted uh, to check out a game there. It looks amazing. You got to go there. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. And when I went there, there were no lights. So in 84... And you know what? They hadn't won in a long time. And I'm not saying we had a bunch of guys from the Phillies go there via trades well, and everything. Yeah. Well, well Dallas. Dallas Green was there too, right? Right. He he was he was the uh, the GM. Right. He brought all the guys he thought were winners and everything. And then eighty four we won the division and we ended up playing San Diego. Event and we went up two games to none. And then we go out there and they sweep us a three game series and they end up playing Detroit. Detroit beat them. In the World Series, I really believe if we'd have won that series, we would have given Detroit a good run. But it, the reason I liked it at Wrigley is because it was like an everyday job. You get up in the morning, 
And at the end of the day, you go home, have regular dinner, be with the family. The only bad part about that, having no lights, is you go on a road trip and you go to San Diego, L.A., or San Francisco, you're playing all night games. Then you come back home to Wrigley, and they're all day games. It takes a while for your body to get used to that. Yeah. Dallas Green made a point, and this team's never going to win until you get lights here because they, they kept voting against lights at Wrigley, and, and Dallas was a big advocate. You need lights here. Now, why did they and vote against it? Was, was just just the I tradition of the it? Community that the neighborhoods around there wanted nothing to do with it. Okay. And uh, so, city, excuse me, city council finally got it. To, they passed it, and the Cubs eventually won their first ever against uh, Cleveland. Yep. So. Yeah. So, uh, speaking of the Cubs, um, tell me how your friend Ryan Sandberg's doing. I know he um he's doing good. He's doing all right. Okay, good. Days ago. Yeah, he's he's going through treatment now. I mean, he's it's a it, he said I, I was really scared the way this thing happened, but he thinks that everything's under control now. That's good. Uh, he's doing treatment. Uh, and next three months are going to be important. He's got three days of chemo on in February, three in March, three in April. So you know, we say our prayers for him. Absolutely. Uh, his spirits his spirits sound great. Uh, so as long as mentally he's ready to, to battle this thing, uh, you know, I'll keep updating him and uh, calling him. And he'll, he'll, I'll keep up calling him so he can update me because uh, he was a special player. Absolutely. Uh, one more medical update, if you don't mind. How's Charlie Manuel doing? Charlie's doing good. Okay. He came to fantasy camp. Uh, it's, a, it's a slow progress, but he's going to be here at spring training, which oh, that's great. I'm very happy. That's, for. that's great to hear. And he'll be walking around, talking, hitting probably. But he's uh, he's come a long way, and uh, people don't understand the magnitude of when you have a stroke like that. Uh, a lot of things happen, and he had to almost learn how to speak again. And but he's he's doing good right now, and I'm looking forward to seeing him here in the next week or so. Do you ever, you know, obviously kind of tongue in cheek? Do you ever kind of get on him because you know he he followed you as Philly's manager? And oh, to yeah. me, you I set, I, I set the table. You brought you exactly. I you kind of you taught that team how to win. <laughs> I did. I, I did. We had every year we played over five hundred. When I took that team over, it was a hundred loss team. Nothing against Terry Frangona. That was a bad team. Right. You, you see what Terry eventually did. He, he's Absolutely. Be a Hall of Fame, man. Yeah. But uh, and so when I went in there, man, it was hard to change the attitude and you know people players getting used to losing. They accept it. You know. I always say you deal with it. Never accept losing. And I had a bunch of guys that didn't buy in at first, and he kept getting on them and letting them know, hey, this is the way we got to do it. And they responded. And then, uh, you know, Charlie came in, and eventually they won in uh, 2008, which is great. So you obviously know what it takes to be a successful manager. You were a manager of the year. Um Tell me about talk to me about Rob Thompson. What what makes him so great? And this is you know no disrespect to Joe Girardi because he, you know we all know right. his, we all know his track record. But but right. Rob Thompson came in and he turned things around. He did. He, he he's he, he's uh, he's very he's a low key guy that really pays attention to detail. He's paid his dues. He he played. He was in the minor leagues as a player, coach, farm director. Then he went to the big leagues and he coached under Joe Torrey. So he's learned from a lot of good people. He's a great communicator. He never lies to players. He might not tell them what they want to hear. Uh, he, he tells you what he sees. And uh, I think that's with this generation of players, they might not want to hear it, but if you're honest with them, you know, when they walk away, they're probably mad. But as they sit down and realize that, hey, he's being upfront with me, I think that's what they want. He expects guys to go out and perform. He expects them to give 100%. But most of all, he, he communicates with everybody, whether you're an extra man on the team, whether you're the 26th player on the team, the last pitcher in the bullpen. He treats you as the professional, and I think uh, he's gotten the most out of doing what he's done. I, I totally agree with that. Um, a couple more things, and I promise you I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go. Um, okay. I, I stumbled across... Uh, a couple weeks ago, MLB Network Radio was playing, was replaying one of the games from the 2009 World Series, and it was it was Scott Fransky and Larry Anderson. It was the Philadelphia broadcast, 
And just hearing all the names, you know, that'll bring up Alex Rodriguez. That'll bring up Derek Jeter. And at one point they said, uh, you know, Jeter hits a foul ball down the third base line past third base coach Rob Thompson. I'm like, I, I forgot he spent all those years with the Yankees. You spent some time with the Yankees as well. Um, what was that right. like? I mean, how long was it? A year or two? Two years with Joe. Two years. Then when he got fired, I went with Joe out to to L.A. L.A. For, so I followed Joe. I went with Joe. Uh, I will be honest with you. Uh, when I was growing up, every Saturday there was a game of the week on, and the Yankees were on every single Saturday. Yep. Uh, I, they had great teams, and my goal as I was getting ready to progress through the system in Philly, I didn't want to leave Philly, but I wanted to play at Yankee stadium. Never had that opportunity because there was no interleague play then. Oh, that's right. But I remember great players that played at Yankee stadium. And when I got that job as third base coach and I took that field at old Yankee stadium, it was almost like goosebumps up and thinking of the players that played there, the Mantles, Lou Gehrig, Yogi Berra, Whitey Ford, Don Larson. I'll go on and on. Just, and just on. have to go out to Monument and, Park and, and just take a look at all. Just the history, the history of the game, uh, and it was it was something that I said, man. I was a lot younger then. I said that bucket list that's checked off <laughs> because, and and I've been to the new one. It's not even close to the old one. I mean, obviously, it's you, you a can't, lot more modern. You can't recreate they got that. Restaurant. You can't recreate that. The, 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 the people that actually played at the old one, and you sit down, and, and if you know the history of that organization, you go, wow. I mean, that's a big wow. And I was glad I got to do that. No, listen, that sounds like a cool experience, but I, I, I have to tell you, as a lifelong Phillies fan, okay, please forgive me for saying this, but, you know, okay. it, comes, it comes from a good place. You didn't look right with the NY, Larry. Okay, you know it's you just you just need to have here. I'll grab the bobblehead. Just the P. That's what yeah. you got to have. I, I, I see it. I see it. No, I mean I agree. I, you know, like I said, I'm a Philly, no matter what. I, I mean, the Phillies have given me the opportunity to continue in the organization, uh, whether it been Dave Montgomery, whether it was Bill Giles, whether it's Dave Dombrowski, whether it's John Middleton. They have all let me continue to do what I do here. And without their support, I might have been out of baseball a long time ago. And I respect the fact that they they believe in what I do. It's helpful for the organization. And as long as I can keep doing it, you know, the man upstairs is going to determine that. I hope I can continue to do this because I have a lot of fun going around. Once they go on the road, I go watch our minor leaguers. And if Dave wants to know something about a guy, I'll give you my opinion, but without those people that I mentioned, uh, Dallas Green, Paul Owen, I mean, I could go on and on and on. Uh, they gave me the opportunity to, to maintain uh, a, the me being in a Philly uniform, and I'll never, ever forget that. Well, you, 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 you've you always represented the, the, the ball club very well. The, the, the fans love you, and in terms of how long you keep doing this, Listen, man, I'm not just saying this. You, you are ageless. I mean, I, I see those videos that your <laughs> wife puts on social media of the two of you exercising, and you're running up these yeah. stairs, and I'm like, damn, I got to get some inspiration from I gotta, Larry. <laughs> I, I got to try to stay stay somewhat uh, healthy all the time and stay in shape because, you know, these guys now that come out here in spring training, they're bigger, faster, stronger. Right. So I can't go out there and walk around like, oh, I can't. So I hit fungos and do everything, so. They make you feel younger, so it's fun being around these guys. Uh, and that's a good group right now. The Philly Clubhouse is a good group. Uh, they got a bunch of great guys. They have a good mix of veterans and young guys. And, uh, again, like we said at the beginning of this, I'm looking for big things this year. Yeah, and, and, and you got to give Bryce Harper credit, I think, for switching to first base and, and really committing to it. No question. That, that's, that's not an easy job to do. I give him credit. I give Bobby Dickerson, the infield coach, credit uh you know harp harp's the kind of athlete i really believe if you put him anywhere if you give him a m enough time to get reps in he's never going to embarrass himself and right. he proved that he went over to first base and i do know he waited like one other week to 10 days because he didn't feel like he was ready and then once he got out there he was all in i thought he did a great job and of course Let's not talk. Forget about that bat of his, because uh, yeah. <laughs> that's one. Of, that's going to be one of the. That's going to be one of those guys that carry you. He can carry you for months at a time, and uh, obviously, not, if nothing happens to him, 
he's going to be a future Hall of Famer, no doubt about it. And, of course, mixed emotions with Harper moving to first base because that meant Reese Hoskins leaves town. Um, one of the most popular Phillies in the last 20, 25 years. What do you think of him? I think he's a professional from the word go, team player. Uh, you saw him when he's hot. Nobody can get him out when That's he's true. not. You know, but when he's not, he always gets a walk or two. Got a tremendous eye at the plate. Gives you good at bats, no matter who he's facing. And he's not a gold glove first base, but he's uh, w- when he played first, I didn't say, please don't hit it to Reese, because I knew that Reese <laughs> did his prep work, and he's going to give you everything he has. I'm glad he got the contract he got because it sort of gives him an out. Like if he goes to Milwaukee, which is a good hitter's park, and say it's 30 home runs, and maybe, hey, he can re- revisit that free agent market, yeah. or if by chance the need doesn't respond right away and he has a so-so year, he still has another year in Milwaukee. So it's a it's a very good uh, contract for him. But I really believe we missed him last year. Oh, His at bats. I, I agree. He grabbed at bats and everything. Uh, and Team player from the word but, go, Jace. This, but, this guy, he could care less if he went over four. If we won, uh, and you saw when he eventually just left recently to, to go to Milwaukee, the fans responded to how much they loved him and everything. Right. He's a great guy. I'm sure he's going to get a tremendous ovation when they come oh, back. I think time. they come back in. I know. I, and and uh, they're, they're going to show their respect for him and what he meant to the city. I agree. Not only that on the field, but off the field with the charity things he did. Uh, unbelievable. Very big in the community. And and you're right. I think they did miss him last season. And not just on the field. The presence in the locker room, the leadership, uh, that, yeah. that to me, you, you know, you, you, you can't really quantify that. No, he's one of those guys. Uh, if you walked in the clubhouse, you wouldn't know if he was hitting 330 or 030. Right. Same expression on the face, same enthusiasm same leadership qualities it didn't matter what you did the night before he came in with a clean slate hey today's a new day let's go get him uh great team player great team player all right i have kept you long enough one last question okay okay i I cannot let you go without asking you about 1993 you were the third base coach even though that team didn't win the world series it's arguably one of the I was going to say the most popular team, but so let's let's say one of the two most popular Phillies teams in history, maybe top three. What made that team right. so special? I mean, the grittiness, nobody will forget that team. I think one thing, Jason, is that if you go back to the the, uh, the write-ups and spring training, everybody picked this team for last place. That's right. Because we had a bunch of guys that were trying to recapture their careers. They had bad years the previous years. They had one thing in mind, let's win. You, 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 no matter how bad you played the year before, if you had that desire to go out there and play as hard as you can, and we had a bunch of guys that laid it on the line every single night. They were a fun group to be around. There were spats in the clubhouse that never got out. There were guys screaming and yelling at each other. But the one thing when the umpire said play ball, they were all on the same page. And like you said, we got to the World Series. We came up one game short. But it was a fun team to be around. Jim Fergosi did a tremendous job managing that team. Luke was one of the coaches. Johnny Padres. Um, it was it was just it was fun from the first game to the last game. Of course, you never want to walk off as a loser in that World Series. But right. uh, you got a guy like Mitch Williams that people at that time were really getting on. If it wasn't for Mitch, we don't even get there. I agree. You know, I and, totally agree. And then you look at a guy like Mitch after the game. He stood up and answered every question. He, he got death threats. He stood up and he says, you know what? I made a bad pitch. We lost, and I feel as bad as anybody. But to do that, as immediately, like a half hour after it happened, I take my hat off to him. Well, but it was, like I said, it was a fun group of guys to be around. They all played hard. Nobody ever dogged it on that team. Yeah, and and I think I think the way the way Mitch Williams handled it, I think that garnered a lot of respect. Yeah, you 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 mentioned death threats. There's there, there's there's idiots in every fan base, unfortunately. Yeah. But because of the way he handled it, I mean, he ended up having a career for a little while in the media in this town covering the Phillies. I mean, I don't yeah, know how many I mean, you know, how many other towns could that happen in? Uh, not too often, especially with a team this this, this avid a sports fan as Philly. You know, the one thing about all these teams that we're talking about that played in Philly, if you think about the guys that 
at one time or another did something they regret. Uh, Alec Bone said something. Remember, I hate this place. And, he, ha- and he handled that was. brilliantly. Then, the next night he comes out, he apologized. Yep. Standing ovation. Yep. Trey Turner, I stink. I should be doing better. Standing ovation. Mitch Williams gave up the home run, as you said. Now he goes back and has a radio show. He's been on the radio. When you fess up and say, you know what? I made a mistake what I said. I love this city. I play hard for this city. They're going to be on your side. But all those instances that I brought up, these guys fessed up to a mistake they made, and everybody's human. Everybody makes mistakes. Nobody's perfect in this world. And uh, the fact that these guys stood in front of a microphone and said, what I said the other night, I was, I was out of line. I was frustrated. The fans here are great, which they are. Yeah. Are they really avid? Yeah, I, I was out in L.A. They come in the third and leave in the eighth. <laughs> you know, there's nothing like East Coast baseball. New York, Philadelphia, Boston. Boston, yep. I'll even take Chicago in there. These I agree. fans are different. They are different fans. They love their sport. And, you know, when, when you go move farther out west, there's so many other things to do. And if you lose, hey, it's good. If you win, ah, it's okay. But in Philly, let's win. That's what it's about. Well, Larry, as always, the time flies by when I talk to you. I I, I could talk to you all, all night, man. I, I, I so enjoy the conversation. <laughs> um, I can't thank you enough for doing this today, and I hope we can do this again real soon. And here's to a, a yeah. good 2024 for the Fighting Phils. I'm, I'm, I'm saying third time's a charm, so uh, I'm hopefully that maybe uh... – Maybe we get out of the gate in April, and then maybe in July we can talk again on your podcast and say, hey, we're rolling right now, so we'll see what happens. All right. In in July, it's a date. I will call you, and we will do this again, and we're going to talk some more baseball. Larry, thank you. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, Jason. Have a good one. You too. And thanks for tuning in to Episode 8 of the Philly Sports Convo. We'll talk to you next time. Stay connected with us on social media. Join our Discord community and grab merch from our shop. The Philly Sports Convo is a Blue Eye Visual production.